All right, so I am a big picture guy. I, I love hearing all the stories about what God does and reading the teachings, but I love to take a step back and say, what is the big picture of what God is saying? So today we're going to take a little step further in our journey towards Jesus' birth. We're getting really, really close. And I I am so sad because I'm actually going to be away and I'm going to be passing the buck. I'm like, uh, not passing the buck, I'm setting someone up for a slam dunk. How about that? At the the very end here. But uh, so we're going to recap and go just a little bit further today. But this is not just for review. I want you to get the big picture. So follow along with me, and I want you to to walk in every story that we look at. At the beginning, when there is nothing, God speaks. He creates everything, and He chooses us to make us, and He breathes the breath of life into us. Adam and Eve, they are there, and they have a choice to make. They can obey God, or they can choose, like Melanie said, that one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they disbelieve God, they doubt God, and they take of the fruit, and their sin comes in. And what I want you to see is we're going to see patterns here. When sin comes in, consequences and death come in. And that's exactly what happens. Death begins. That's why we have sickness. That's why some people are not here today, right? Because they're sick at home. Why? Because of the fall. Okay, so death comes in and sickness It all comes there. But even in this judgment, there is still mercy. We see that mercy when Jesus, basically when God covers them with the covering, the sacrifice. And we see hope. Four words here. Sin, death, mercy, and hope. You're going to see this pattern over and over again. What is the hope? God's judgment to them, he said that the serpent would one day strike one of the descendants of Adam and Eve. This is a picture of the cross and uh, the suffering that Jesus suffered for us. But in that same moment, Jesus would crush the head of the enemy. And again, we see that in the cross and in the resurrection where he defeats the power of the enemy. Amen? Amen. All right. And so this is the hope. Even at Adam and Eve, they long for that day when God will do that. As time proceeds, you know, Cain commits murder and things don't get any better from there. It begins to get more and more wicked. And then God has to judge when there is sin, there is death, destruction, consequences. And that's what happens. God has to judge all of the world. But even in that judgment, there is mercy. He chooses Noah, a righteous man and his family, and he provides a way for them. And they are safe, brought safe, and there is hope for the new day. Remember, God set that rainbow. I will never again flood the earth. And we see in the ark a picture of Jesus. Everyone who is in the ark, everyone who receives Christ is saved from the destruction. And we see a picture for us. Everyone who receives Jesus into their heart will be saved from the death. As we go by, time goes by, and we have Abraham. God calls Abraham out of a world of wickedness, and he calls him to his own, says, I want you to come and follow me. And in his mercy, he provides a promise to him. I'm going to give you great uh, descendants. They're going to be as numerous as the sand and sea, the stars in the sky. And there is hope for what God's going to do. I'm going to make you into a great Nation, And at that time, God even tells them, your descendants one day are going to be brought into a foreign land and for 400 years they're going to go through bondage. But yet I am going to bring them back and I'm going to bring them back to this land that I am promising you. So time goes by, they're in bondage. God brings them out of that. Well, first of all, that promise is passed from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. Jacob, also known as... Israel, right? His sons go to Egypt. They're in bondage and suffering there. And God provides a deliverer, Moses. And this is God's mercy. And he comes with hope for them. There is a promised land. And God brings them out mightily from there. I've run out of stage, so I'm going to go over here. 
All right. And so God brings them out mightily from that. And we see another pattern emerge. They go into the the wilderness. And in the wilderness, whenever they sin, what happens? Death, destruction, consequences. But yet there is mercy as well. Probably the most uh, famous is they're here at the promised land where God had brought them. They had a choice to step in and receive that promised land. But they disbelieved, and in sin, they wanted to go back to their old way. And so they all had to die, except for Joshua and Caleb. That whole generation died. But yet there was mercy. God didn't wipe them out there. He said, your, your sons and your daughters, they will be able to go into the promised land. They are going to receive this, and there is hope for tomorrow. That generation finally gets to go into the promised land. And you see that same pattern happen throughout Judges. What do you see? When they get into sin, what happens? Death, destruction, consequences, bondage. It always happens. And then what does God do? In His mercy, He sends someone to call them back. And whenever they repent, He comes and there is hope for them for the next day. There is hope for them to enjoy the promised land. This pattern is continued through the kings. Remember the two kings that we looked at? Ahaz, right? What did Ahaz do? He went into complete adultery against God. He worshipped foreign gods, put them in the temple of God. And what were the consequences? Remember, he was surrounded on all sides. They were attacked and it was a dark, dark day in Judah at that time. But that same situation where there was sin, death, destruction, bondage, that was brought to his son Hezekiah. But Hezekiah turned to the Lord and there was mercy and there was hope for the future. Even though he was surrounded on all sides, God was right there with him, protected them and gave him peace in that time. Last week we looked at the darkest, well, very, very dark day in Judah, the last three kings. And we saw, again, this pattern of sin. They allowed uh, terrible things to happen in the temple of God, and death, destruction, bondage comes in. They are brought out of there. Many people are killed, but yet there is an exile. So in this sin, death, destruction, bondage, there is mercy. God goes with them. Remember what did he say about the exiles? I will be a little temple to you. So God's presence goes with these exiles and stays with them, protects them, gives them peace and protection. And there is hope that one day they will return again to the promised land. And God fulfills that, right? Remember, Cyrus gives the edict and says the temple of the Lord can be rebuilt. And so Ezra goes and helps leads that up. Then we see Nehemiah come and the walls are built around uh, uh, Jerusalem at that time. Again, God continues to move. And probably a a great story that we can't leave out is a story of Esther. Remember how God in his mercy, where Haman wanted to destroy every living Jew alive. God in his mercy raised up Esther for such a time as that and rescued the whole people alive. Of Israel. Now we're brought to this. The silent time, right? That's what the Bible, uh, that's what uh, scholars refer to this time between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's called the 400 silent years. But we're not left without wondering some of the things that happened. There's a historian by the name of Je- uh, Josephus who tells us a little bit about what happened. And as I studied this today, i got to be honest with you, I learned a whole lot, and it's kind of exciting. Difficult things that happen, but exciting things. Okay, I'm going to tell you about a Greek ruler and see if you can finish this sentence. This guy conquered most of the known world. His name was Alexander the... Right, Alexander the Great comes in... And he basically takes large, uh, large areas, but he only rules for a short time. He dies, and he has four generals that basically take his, his different lands. They kind of divide it up, fight amongst himself. 
And if we go down the descendants of this, uh, we're going to follow the solution. I hope I'm saying that one right. Uh, their descendants down, and there is a ruler that is, ranks right up there with the most wicked. And his name was Anti- Ant- Antica- ah, say that. Antiochus Epiphanes. And I'll probably mispronounce that. But Antiochus Epiphanes. How, how many of you have heard of this guy before? Okay, thank you. This guy was the embodiment of evil. Matter of fact, some of uh, what Daniel prophesied was initially filled with him. And again, it's a type where we see it happen again in Revelation and more fulfillment. But here's some things that he does. And this is about 175 B.C., before Christ. Uh, He comes and he renames Jerusalem after himself, calls it Antioch. He takes articles of gold out of the temple. He attacked uh, the Jewish people on the Sabbath. He put Jews to death for studying the Torah. He outlawed circumcision. He ordered the worship of pagan gods in the temple. And here's the one that, that gets you. He offered pig's blood in the temple of God, and he raised a statue basically to Zeus in the temple of God. He defiles the very temple of God. It was said of this, the abomination that causes desolation. Now, at this time, there was a priest that was being forced uh, to offer sacrifices to these foreign gods. His name was Mattathias, and he rebels against this. He says, I'm not going to do this. And he kills the person that is trying to force him to do this. And this starts a rebellion against the, the rulers at this time. Uh, this is the Maccabean rebellion. His four sons, one of them we're going to talk about right now. His name was Judah Maccabee. And he led a rebellion which eventually took back the temple of God. Have you ever heard, the, have you heard of the name Maccabees? Anybody know what that means? means the hammer. They were the hammer of Judah at that time, fighting on behalf of them. And they were really against all odds. It's a mighty army, but they they used the land in strategic ways. And there might have been somebody working on their behalf. What do you think? Yeah, God was looking out for them. And so finally, they're able to take back the temple. But imagine what it was like to walk into the temple. You see blood everywhere. You see a foreign God, and, and you remember what the temple looked like, how that must have, have shocked them. But they start, and it takes them eight days, and they completely clean out the temple of God. And during that time, uh, they begin, I wish I, oh, here's my one big graphic. Are you ready? So you notice in the temple of God, there's a lampstand that's here with seven candles on it. And so they had enough oil to, to light it for one day. And the miracle that is said on this time, again, we can't say this 100% if it was right or not, not necessarily word of God, but we believe that this probably happened. God obviously can do anything. So they had enough oil for one day, and for those eight days, God preserved that oil so it would light the entire eight days. And how many of you know what this celebration is called? Hanukkah. That's right. Uh, I may surprise you. Did you know that Jesus celebrated Hanukkah? Look in your Bibles. Open up to John chapter 10 and verse uh, 22 and 23. John chapter 10, verse 22 and 23. give you a quick minute to find it. If not, you can just listen. John 10, 22 says, Then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem. Would you like to know what that word dedication is? It's Hanukkah, right? And so Jesus celebrated the feast of Hanukkah at Jerusalem. It was winter And Jesus was in the temple area walking in Solomon's colonnade. So when you hear of people celebrating Hanukkah, 
you can know where this comes from. Now, why in the world are there uh, seven candles here, and on the other side there are eight candles? Anybody guess? Because that's the, how many days, and if you go back to the time of Solomon, during that dedication of the temple of God, they did eight days of celebration, and so that's why there's eight. How about this? What is this called? A dreidel. Now, I would sing the song, but I don't know it, so. <laughs> All right. But the reason for this dreidel, or what, what has been said, is remember how I told you uh, that the, the, the enemy's forces were kind of coming around, they're outlawing the, the study of the Torah. Some children would be outside of their building, and they would either be studying the Torah, and they would always have this with them, and when uh, the officers began to come, they would start playing the game. And while they're playing this game, they could, when the officials would come to talk to them, they could explain the game to them and say, oh, we're just playing a game here. And uh, so this was basically a, a decoy to keep them from finding out that they're really studying the Torah and following after God. So this game was a source of protection for them. If you would like to know how to play. Can you explain to them? Okay. Uh, you can talk to Patricia afterwards. I did a little bit of study on it, but she could do a much better job at it. All right. So in this time, uh, Judah Maccabee leads this rebellion. They take back the temple of God. They re- rededicate it to the Lord, and God pers- uh, protects him in this time. As time goes by, eventually... The temple is is raided again, destroyed. But one of the Herods, right? When you think of Herod, I want you to think of Pharaoh because basically it's a title. So there are many different Herods. And so one of the Herods started the rebuilding of the temple of God again. And this is where we pick up on history. So don't forget about the patterns. I want you to open up the Word of God to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And I want you to be thinking about the oppression and throughout time how much Israel was tried to to be destroyed so many different times. And let's pick up in Luke chapter 1 and verse 5. Now, in the time of Herod, king of Judah. Now, was Herod Jewish? No. Herod was actually an Edomite, descendant of Edom. But yet he was made a governor over Judah and they allowed him to claim the title of king, even though he was not a king. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron, two godly people. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, he was serving as a priest before God. Just so you know, uh, the divisions, they would be serving for about two weeks out of an entire year. So there's a lot of of priests being able to do this. So there's only two weeks that they are needed. And verse 9 says, He was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So just in case you didn't know, this was a a once-in-a-lifetime thing. There were some priests that never had this opportunity. Matter of fact, if you were chosen to do this, afterwards you were considered rich by everyone else. So it was a a very special moment for him. Verse 10, And when the time for the burning of the incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. I just want you to kind of get a a picture. He's going to present uh, this incense before the Lord. In order to do this, he's got to walk by something on his left. You know what it is? Right up there. I wonder, as he goes to present the incense, does 
he remember the, the, the events of Hanukkah? Does he think about all that, that Israel has suffered? So he goes to present this incense before the Lord. Now, incense represents the prayers. We see this throughout Revelations in many different places. And so he goes and presents this, this, uh, this incense before the Lord, and it says that everybody else is outside. So kind of want you to picture him by himself presenting this incense. Everybody is, is outside, and they are prostrate before the Lord. They're calling out to God for the redemption of Israel to, to bring back safety to them out of bondage. And we continue on. It says, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Have you ever been home by yourself? It's kind of dark. No one else there. And all of a sudden, your cat jumps out. And you go, wow, you're not expecting that, right? You think you're all by yourself. Something shocks you. Imagine, here Zechariah thinks he is all by himself. He's presenting this incense, and then all of a sudden, right before him, was an angel of the Lord. Obviously, he is greatly afraid. And this is what he says. Uh, Verse 12, uh, when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. So obviously, Zechariah is is praying for a son, right? I don't think so. You know why? Because the scripture says that they were well beyond the years of being able to have children. You look on the other side... And when God does something, he doesn't even believe it because he thinks that she's too old to be able to have it. So how many of you pray for things that you know that there's no way you can have? I don't think that that was Zachariah's prayer. I believe that he was praying for the redemption of Israel. He's praying for God to move on Israel's behalf. And as he's praying for this, the angel gives him the answer. And here's the answer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. So his son is going to be part of the answer. And you are to give him the name John. Does anybody know what the name John means? The Lord is gracious. The Lord is gracious. And I began to think, the Lord was gracious to Adam and Eve and provided hope. The Lord was gracious to Noah and it rescued him. The Lord was gracious to Abraham and told him, I'm going to bless your descendants. I'm going to give you this promised land. The Lord was gracious to the people of Israel and brought them out of, G- out of Egypt and brought them to the promised land. Throughout the many different encounters in Judges and throughout Kings, when people tried to destroy them, the Lord was gracious, even down to Haman trying to kill all Jews. Antiochus, Epiphanes, trying to kill all Jews. The Lord is gracious. Does he think about any of those things as he hears those words? The Lord is gracious. You're to give him the name John. Verse 14, he will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to drink wine or other fermented drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel. And this is, I want you, if you're underlining anything here, I want you to underline verse 16. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. Don't overlook this one. This is so important. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. You know, you can look at events in two different ways. You can look at all the the bondage that Israel faced, the many people who tried to to destroy them, the many times throughout Judges and the Kings, these these oppressors that, that came to hurt them. And you could say, I wish God would deal with all of these foreign lands that are are trying to destroy them. But what if God wipes them completely out? Does that solve everything? 
If they are still worshiping false gods, what's going to happen? The same exact thing. And so in order to change the circumstance, you don't deal with the external. You get to the heart. And the heart is to turn people back to God. Remember the pattern. Sin, death, destruction, bondage. But yet there is mercy and there is hope if you will turn to the Lord. And that was John's job, to bring back people to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. He's a prophet of God. To turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. We didn't spend a lot of time on this, but what is the message of the prophets? If you look at Isaiah, Jeremiah... All the prophets, what are they doing? When the people of Israel are sinning against God, what are they saying? You're going to suffer death. You're going to suffer bondage. You're going to suffer destruction. Turn to the Lord. And when they turn to the Lord, what's the message? Mercy, hope. God's going to bring you back. God's going to deliver you. And this same message is the message that John has. He's trying to wake people up. Get right with God. This is the source of your problem. Verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. I wonder if his wife heard that. It wasn't very nice of him. Verse 19, the angel answered, I am Gabriel. Just imagine the, the hush that happens right then. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. They're like, what's going on? He sure is in there a long time. When he came out, he could not speak to them. Just imagine the crowd there. They've been waiting a long time. That all of a sudden, he comes out. He is glowing. How many of you ever had something happen to you that's like so amazing that you got to tell somebody? Imagine that all of a sudden, your lips are sealed. You know, that frustration... I just saw an angel. This is amazing. I can't even say anything. He's stuck there. Uh, And so, obviously, he did some really good sign language. Maybe uh, Creighton could could have helped him out in that that moment, gave him some good sign language. Uh, But he was able to convey the fact uh, that an angel had appeared to him. Something amazing had happened. Uh, Let's go ahead and, and look. Verse 23. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. Afterwards, uh, after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these dark days, or in these days, he has shown his favor. Again, the graciousness of God. And taken away my disgrace among the people. I want you to skip because, again, I am saving uh, the parts about Jesus as much as I can. Uh, for in the future. We're going to look Luke chapter 1 and verse 39. It says, At that time Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home. And just in case you're looking, this is Luke chapter 1 and verse 40. When she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So this John was was filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. This is already happening inside of her. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of what? My Lord should come to me. So again, John knew, again, filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke through Elizabeth. This is my Lord. This is God coming. Verse 44, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. 
Blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has said will be accomplished. Let's skip to verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. We're going to go ahead and skip down to verse 67. They give him the name John. And this is what Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit, prophesied. Verse 68 He prophesies, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, again, as you listen to this, I want you to remember the history of Israel, of Judah, and how God has been working throughout time. It says, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come. Past tense. Remember, Jesus is is already in the womb here. Okay? Because he has come, and again, past tense, has redeemed his people. So this is a, something that is already settled. It's going to be done. He has come and rescued. He has bought back his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servants, David. 71, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Does he remember Haman? Does he remember Antiochus, Epiphanes, and all that was done? Does he remember the cruelty of the Romans at that time? And does he remember Satan, our real enemy at that time? To show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, that oath to Isaac, to Jacob, and down the line, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear. Again, if you are underlining, this is a great one to underline. To enable us to serve him without fear. So again, what is the root of the problem? Their sin. And they're following in a a wrong direction. Again, part of this promise is that he's going to give them the ability to serve Him in holiness, in righteousness, before Him all our days. Verse 76, And you, my child, speaking of John, you will be called a prophet of the Most High. You'll be a prophet of God. For you will go on before who? The Lord. So what do we learn about Jesus here? He is the, the Lord, the Most High, to prepare the way for Him. How does He prepare the way? Repent, for the kingdom of God is coming. Get right with God. To give His people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Notice, it wasn't to give people the knowledge of salvation, how to get free from the Romans, the battle plan on how to get there. It wasn't that. Here's what he says again. It says, to give His people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God. Even though they have sinned and gone away from the Lord. Sin, death, destruction, bondage. There is the mercy of God. And there is hope for the future. By which the rising sun will come to us from heaven. Just like you can bank on the fact that the sun is going to come up every single day. Here you can bank on the fact that he is going to come. To shine on those living in darkness. We see here a little bit of God's uh, salvation is going to come even to the Gentiles. And the, the prophets of old have prophesied of that as well. And in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And then we'll go ahead and close this up with verse 80. And the child grew and became strong in the spirit. And he lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel. How I want to close this up is this. You know, often when we look at the problems in our life, what do, we, what do we say to God? God, will you fix all of these situations? Will you fix all of these consequences? And I want to be careful. Just because something bad happens to you doesn't mean that, that you're in this big sin and, and God's judging you. There are times that we all are going to walk through difficulties, and it doesn't necessarily mean there is sin. But if you stole something, and now you're in prison and asking God to to relieve you of those consequences, you need to know that that's not the real problem. 
right? If you have been lying and you finally got caught on it, your real problem is not God rescuing you from those consequences. You put in whatever sin you want to put in and the consequences that come from it. You need to stop focusing on the outside consequences and you need to see the pattern throughout all of the scripture. Sin, consequences, death, bondage. But yet for those who turn, there is mercy and there is always, always hope. Isn't that that the message of the word of God? If if you look throughout the Old, Old Testament, you see this picture of a God who's, who's not willing for anyone to perish. He doesn't delight in the death of people. He is trying to call people to him. He's just asking, pleading with them to turn to him. So would you stand with me? And Mel, if you wouldn't mind coming, I don't know if you could find that song, uh, There is a Redeemer. I don't know if you could do that. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. And yeah, I've got to be honest with you. There are some times that I come to preach and I almost say to God, why do I have to talk about sin again? Isn't, isn't there something more fun that we could talk about, God? <laughs> but really, if we look at it throughout Scripture, this is the message over and over and over again. God is trying to wake people up to turn from their sin so that they can experience uh, the mercy and the graciousness of God. And so we're here today. We live in this time where Jesus has, has died for our sins to pay for all the wrong things that we have done. And we have this opportunity because of the mercy of God to receive the forgiveness. God uh, will, will take our heart of stone and will make it flesh. He can move inside of us. But even in this time, don't get to that spot where you think that you can continue in your sin and think that God does not care. You know, it would be a travesty to the people of Israel, people of Judah, to say that you can continue in your sins, snub your uh, whatever at God, and think that everything will be okay. No, if you sin, there are consequences that come. But just like God had mercy on the people of Israel, God desires to extend his mercy to you today. So stop. Look inside of your heart right now. Have you given in to to sin? Have have you kind of given up on following God? Have you brought foreign gods into the temple of your heart? Are you doing things to defile the temple of God living inside of you? Today, turn from that. Turn to the Lord. Come and bring your sin before God. If that's you today, I want you to just pray a prayer, something like this with me, if you mean it from your heart. Say, Father, I am so uh, grieved that I have sinned against you. Lord, I've defiled my heart. I'm walking in a direction just like so many of the stories that I've read in the Bible where I've doubted you or I've gone right against what you have said. I've done this, I've done that. God, I don't want to be like that. I want to be one of those times like Hezekiah where I turn to the Lord and and I give my life to follow after God with all my heart. I want to be like that. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would come forgive me of my sins, cleanse me, be my Lord and my Savior, and help me to live for you unashamedly, Lord. And I thank you for your mercy, for your grace, and for the hope of heaven and so much more. We're going to close with a song today. And if God is dealing with your heart, there's some things that you need to talk to God about. Maybe it's sin. Maybe there's just some difficult situations. You know, uh, with the the story related around Hanukkah, we don't have any uh, direct thing that, that says that they were in active sin, you know, against the Lord where they were judged. It was just something that was happening right then. 
So sometimes difficult things happen. In the midst of that, we can still come before the Lord and ask for deliverance. Same way in Egypt. We don't see any big thing that the reason why they were in Egypt was because of sin. They were just there. And so whether there's sin that you need to deal with or you just say that there's some difficult things happening in your life and you need God to to come and to rescue and be your help, I challenge you to find a place at this this altar. And I want to close with with one last statement. As we look at the Christmas season and the Christmas story, we need to remember that Jesus is the mercy of God extended to us. He is the descendant who crushed the head of the serpent. He is the ark of our salvation. Like Moses, he is our deliverer. He is what dwells inside of the holy of holies. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. He is the savior. He is the Messiah, the one we've been longing for. He is our hope, our God, and our redeemer. I challenge you to find a place at this altar. Talk to the Lord.